This is going to be the last video in the series and I start out with a musical score and the reason is because I do mention, you know, last but not least, there's a lot of really interesting neural net and AI art programs that are that deal with the audible, that is audio generation and music generation. And so uh, I'll mention just a couple of things that you can, you can look for in that realm. So in that realm, um, Google Magenta is a project. Magenta is a project at Google, and you can see all of the cool work that group has done, the Magenta group. And OpenAI has something called OpenAI Jukebox, and so I've got a link to that along with examples. And so this is a great way to sort of begin your journey into AI performative arts music. There are plenty of other things on the web. Uh, it's true that I haven't spent as much time talking about music and, and audio, but there's a lot of interesting things happening. One is you may have heard of the tool Audacity. Now, Audacity is a tool that allows you to look at mono and stereo waveforms and then do analyses on those waveforms. So an interesting turn of events is where Audacity now has neural filters built into it. And this is something you're going to see with other software. There's software out there in terms of photography and imaging which is specifically labeled AI software for you know increasing the resolution of your image, sharpening the image, and so forth. Um, Adobe Photoshop notably has something called neural filters. So I mean I'm adding some information this doesn't have anything to do with music but just uh, on the same theme that you know a lot of commercial software is moving in this direction and if they can get something that's near real time in terms of being interaction, interactivity, then they'll put that in their, in their packages. There's a lot of interesting things going on from a worldwide perspective. Uh, China has a uh, software technology called Cogview, and you can enter text and get images. Uh, RU Dale is from Russia. This is fairly recent within the last couple of weeks. Uh, some really interesting results from using that. Uh, there's a, no, a Colab notebook for, for this one. For Cogview, I just, you go to the, the, the Chinese site and you use Google Translate if you need to, to translate into uh, Chinese and then play around with Cogview. So a lot of interesting things, things are happening around the world, right? And that's interesting. Like, are you Dalé? This is something that I got when I entered a still life painting with objects on, on a cloth. So I entered that and then R.U. Dele came up with this mosaic of different images. And it did a pretty good job, I think, really. Um, you know, these, these images don't exist anywhere but in the dreams of R.U. Dele. But I think what the... Uh, what the Russian group has done is just fantastic. Uh, here's another example from R.U. Deli, a uh, still life painting with objects on a cloth. This, these are kind of the best. So the notebook kind of gives you a bunch of images and then it has a, a selection of what's so-called the best. But ultimately, I think you should rely on your own artistic judgment for determining what's, uh, what's best to you. Uh, on the left, the left is two images here. On the left image, so I was wanting to create um, seascapes. And I would enter a seascape study with a rain cloud. I made a mistake on the left. I made a mistake because instead there was an initial prompt, which was a seascape uh, constable. He painted something, seascape study with rain cloud. So he painted that. I put the image down. But my mistake in the text prompt, instead of putting this on the bottom, I put the uh, URL 
And so the URL was being used by the software to create a seascape study. And you get some really interesting effects here. So the bottom line is here is, you know, mistakes are your friend. Failure is definitely your friend in playing around in this space. Uh, you'll try just different things. Sometimes you'll make a mistake. And sometimes mis these mistakes turn out to be quite interesting. Uh, you should always think of what you do in terms of a workflow. You probably have a workflow if you think about it and you're doing design or art. And that workflow defines the process you go through. In this particular case, this is a kind of workflow on imaging. And so noise can be added uh, and you know the different functions which are these squares and rectangles are functions and then the flow from left to right is going through those functions and then the final result is you come out with this but this is indicative of a workflow I mean on one hand you know when this was created it was created as a set of filters in a data flow style in order to create this result on the left um, through the output of this rectangle. But uh, this is something that's indicative of any workflow. Any workflow when formalized will look somewhat like this. And so think about what you want to create, how you want to create it, and think about your workflow a little bit because there's nothing wrong with say putting Adobe Photoshop as a link after or before things that you're doing within the AI art realm. So some suggestions, pick a theme, an artist, genre, style that you like, right? Something that you're gonna find interesting. Otherwise, what's the point, right? Uh, pick a pre-trained or to be trained model. And this is a case where in some cases, training has to be done. And you, uh, in other cases, somebody else has already trained a model and on, on a data set like WikiArt data set or ImageNet. Okay, these are gigantic data sets involving images and sometimes images with classes or uh, text descriptions, captions. Choose how you want to plan to translate across media, image to text, image to video. Just think about that a little bit. Uh, I prefer the collab uh, note, notebook route. And I would say most of the AR artists out there do as well. Uh, you can start with the web and just create things like that. But if you want to get and dive into things a little bit more, I highly recommend using uh, Colab. Use a theme while tinkering with the hyperparameters. The hyperparameters are the things, the values that you're going to change each time you run the AI art software. Keep track of parameter settings and store images from your experiments. So I, I think this whole thing being um, some, some curation as a result of a wide variety of experiments, I think is, is interesting and is a natural thing you would do. I mean, you do it in photography, right? If you're gonna go out, if we're, you take a professional photographer, they're going to go out and take uh, whatever they need to take. Maybe it's they're working on a wedding and they're taking pictures of the bride and groom. Now, um, they're going to take thousands of photographs, but they're only going to curate or pick ones that they, the photographer thinks are the best quality, maybe the best diversity, the best quality. And you're going to be doing the same thing. I mean, the photographer uses a camera technology using AI art technology, but I think the analogy is very similar between the two. You're going to curate, you're going to experiment, and you may not, you know, s some of the uh, experiments are things you like and some maybe you don't, don't like as much. There is a kind of, you know, I personally wear two couple of different hats. I have an art hat, I've got a science hat. Uh, science suggests is reproducibility. And if you're looking at a Twitter feed with AI art coming you know, on the Twitter feed, um, the scientist wants to know how, how it was done. 
right? Because they want to be able to re reproduce at least partially the result. However, the artist is interested in expressing themselves and uh, leaving maybe to question, well, how was it done and so on. And I think both perspectives are valuable, but just keep them in mind as you are on social media, right? Is that um, people will probably get annoyed if every single comment is, how did you do this? And w will you please give me your collab notebook? But sometimes that's, I think that's a, a valid set of questions, right? It kind of depends. Um, and on the other side, if you're an artist producing really cool stuff, maybe once in a while giving a hint as to, you know, here's the prompt you used in order to create the work that you did. You know, that helps other people. And in terms of prompts, you will hear of prompt engineering. I've heard that term, but I don't think it's engineering. I definitely think that it's an art. So I would call it the art of prompting. Uh, and this is a really interesting video from a arts perspective and a philosophy kind of perspective. Highly recommend watching this by Lily Alexander. Um, she describes a lot of things that she thought about and there's a lot of philosophy that's I think quite relevant to the AI art scene that uh, she and her partner uh, sort of go over. So I, I this is a, this definitely a video that's worth your time. In terms of acknowledgments, and the fact is, there's so many I could list. I'm just listing some of the ones that were key for me. And uh, not ever, I, I didn't. I've necessarily communicated or direct messaged any of these people or all of these people, uh, but I have direct messaged many of them. And um, I, I definitely want to credit them with my AI art thinking and helping educate me on what this field uh, is doing and what's possible. In terms of who are the AI artists, I haven't seen a survey, but I would say most of us are hybrids and would feel comfortable with that identity. We have interests in design, art, programming, and computing. And so to some extent, if you are a hybrid as well, and you like this combination of things, you are definitely going to like the AI art area. And so with that, I'm going to leave, leave you with uh, some things to think about um, on, your, on your journey. Begin where you want to begin with art design that you want to create. And uh, from there, I wish you the best of, of journeys. I, it's, a, it's a tremendous amount of fun.